I want to preach tonight about bring honey into your marriage. Somebody says, I don't know what that's all about. Well, I hope by the end of the lesson, you'll know what we're talking about, but you're not likely to be understanding it for the next 10 minutes or so. So I put a little subtitle under that, and this is not a verse in the Bible, but it is little things mean a lot. You remember that uh, two weeks ago on a Sunday morning, we ask you to put to fill out some uh, questionnaires about what has my mate done that has really enhanced our marriage? And uh, what little things have they done? Not massively giant things. I don't think any of you said, my husband surprised me and gave me a new Mercedes. I, that's, not the, that's not what we're talking about. And so uh, they'll be a part of the lesson tonight. And so the last half of this lesson is yours, it's not mine. And we'll talk about, uh, about that later. But, uh, but we just need uh, to understand that. We're not going to look at the text yet. We'll come back to the text in a little bit. But I want to just talk about when we talk about little things mean a lot, I want to talk about the power of little things in the Bible. Have you ever thought about the fact that, uh, uh, that there are those little things that are mentioned in the Bible that really have great power and great meaning? Think about what Jesus said about little children. That's not the, the impact of our lesson to spend a long time looking at that. But those disciples that were there were discussing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus brought a little child and set that child in the midst of them and said, except you be converted. I think that word converted is interesting. They were headed down the wrong path. And Jesus says, hang on just a minute, guys. You're trying to figure out who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to sit on the right hand, and who's going to sit on the left. Back up, you know, make a U-turn. You're going down the wrong road. Here's what you got to look at. Look at this little child. And then he said, if you don't become like this little child, there's no way you can go to heaven. Is that important? I mean, you think about it, uh, you know, Nate and Cindy, think about little Levi, and, you know, a year from now, he'll be talking about God. Two years from now, and three years from now, he'll be talking about God made the world. And he'll love God with all of his heart, assuming that you do what I'm confident that you'll do in the rearing of that child. But little Levi's going to believe in God. He's going, he, he's going to be unquestionably believing in God. And hopefully there'll be that part of his little life when he'll share what he has. Do you understand what I mean? Uh, but, but that's just, he says, except you humble yourself and become like a little child. And those of you who teach in our educational program in this church, and you're teaching those kids who are five and six and seven and eight years of age, isn't that great? Isn't it great how they just, uh, they just have such a love for God and they can hardly wait? And I, this morning I was walking out of the office area and in that, in that classroom that's right across from the office where one of the, one of the smaller classes are, there are little children running in there to get to the table. I thought, that, isn't that great? Maybe we ought to be converted about to running into the church building, you know? You understand what I mean? He can hardly wait to get here. And Jesus said, you want to learn what life is all about? You need to look at this little child. And then he says to those disciples, you've not only got to con be con converted like they are, you have got to, uh, to uh, not set roadblocks in front of them. I think it's remarkable Jesus talk about these little children that have faith in God. And oh, how America needs to hear this. We teach our children to have faith in the God. They get in the educational system. And God is oftentimes mocked in the class. You know what God says about that? But he's saying it to, to these disciples. He's saying it to those individuals who, who are people in the church. And he's saying it to us. That don't you ever put a stumbling block in front of one of these little children. That's in Matthew chapter 18. That's those first five verses that are there. Back in chapter 10, verse 4, he says, If you give a cup of cold water to a little child, God remembers that. Isn't that amazing? I remember in the old building on 36th Street, we had the Mr. Chewing Gum Man. And, you know, Brother Harvey Fort, I think it was the one who was, 
and the children came to see Harvey Fort, and every week they got, the, they, they got chewing gum from him. And over the years, there's been those individuals who've brought, who've brought uh, gifts to give to our children. Are you aware? That's the kind of thing Jesus is saying. We owe a tremendous obligation. Listen, to every little child that runs around in this building, we owe them something because Jesus said, you'd better look at them and you've got to look at them and look at this world through their eyes or you'll never go to heaven. Little children can teach us one of the most profound truths in the Bible. What about the little leaven that leavens the whole lump? We don't understand about leaven. We don't, un we don't understand what yeast is all about. But uh, years ago, you knew what it was like. You know, before the days when you, when you had uh, self-rising flour, you had, something, had to put something in there to make, to make the biscuits rise. Well, what are you going to put in there? Well, you, put, you, you, can, you can put uh, some yeast in there of some form or another. Now, I remember my grandmother, every time after she'd make biscuits, she'd just take one, just a, 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 a wad of that dough, just about, just about so big, and put it up on the shelf. What are you doing that for? Well, you'll see. And the next day, she's making biscuits, and she throws that water, that old dough in there. And, and she mixes it all up. You know why? She wants the biscuits to rise the next day. The tiniest amount of leaven has unbelievable power. And so the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman hid in the measure, three measures of, of meal, and, uh, and, 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 it, and it spread. And then in reference to righteousness and unrighteousness, a little leaven levels the whole lump. When we begin talking about little things in your marriage, you need to understand there's an application that in your marriage, these little things that become a part of the latter, the, the latter part of this lesson, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leaven your marriage. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we, as we talk about the fact that how we treat others oftentimes is the, way, is the way they treat us. And if we'll treat them in the right way, who knows, but perhaps a little leaven will leaven them even if your marriage is in the pits. There's a third thing, and that is little sins can create a lot of sins. I've got the illustration here, Joseph's brothers. You know that story from from uh, the verses from Isaiah 30 and verse 1, that's not where you read about Joseph's sin. It talks about Israel, and they add sin to sin. Jealousy over a coat of many colors. I wish I had that coat. In fact, I resent the fact that he's got it. I ought to have that coat of many colors. Led them to wanting to kill their own brothers. When they were jealous of that, of, that, uh, uh, of that coat, I doubt very seriously. I said, well, let's just, just kill him and get the coat away from him. They probably were not on that page. But they were moved with envy, and they would have killed him. And then they came back, and they lied to their dad. How did all that start? It started when they saw a coat of many colors. Adding sin to sin. But the same thing true is of, is of righteousness and how that it can, it can spread in that way. You know what Jesus said about the tongue? Behold how great a fire, a little, uh, how, how great a, a, a fire, you know, a little spark can, can ignite. Who's that uh, individual that says, you know, don't, you know, be careful with your matches, put out your campfires, you understand what I'm talking about? One match struck and left in the wrong place could start all of that devastation we saw in California. Where'd that come from? Well, James talks about that, and then he says, hang on a minute, I'm not talking about matches and forest fires, I'm talking about your tongue. When we talk about some of these little things that you've suggested in your marriage, you need to understand that the Bible says that tongue that speaks in bitterness, that song, that, that tongue that comes out of a out, out of a heart that can sing praises to God, and then out of that fountain of his heart comes forth cursing and bitterness 
and anger inside the marriage? He said, it cannot happen. And he says, you know why? Because that evil that comes out of the tongue comes straight from hell. This is the only time anybody in the Bible other than Jesus uses this word hell, Gehenna, the Greek word, it's the only time anybody other than Jesus used it. Jesus used it, you know, 10 or 15 times. One time in the rest of the New Testament does that word appear, and it's talking about the very things that we're, that we're talking about. That is, what, what, how do you speak to your mate? How do you speak to your children? How do you speak to your parents? Your tongue is a little member that boasts great things. And then there's a, there's a forest fire that can come from one match. And you think back to times of fusses in your life, they probably started over things that didn't matter that much at all. And on the other side, think of how much good can come out of good words that can, can, can uh, keep that fire from ever, ever growing and will create spiritual growth in everyone. And now... Jacob understood the power of a little honey. Can we go back to slide two? Go back, go back to that text of Genesis 43. You read that. As it was read, I hope you understand. It's whenever Joseph is, a, is down to the land of Egypt. His brothers do not know that that's Joseph. And Joseph has told them, you cannot come back down here and buy any more grain unless you bring your little brother. And Jacob is all upset. Why did he even tell him I had, yeah, you had another brother? And we left out verses, you know, 7 through 10, just so we could get to the point of verse 11. Jacob was saying, you cannot go. And finally he resolves himself. The only way we're going to have any food <coughs> is to take that money that was put in the money bag the first time Add to it the money for the grains we're going to take this time. Carry all of that money. We're going to do what's right down there. But we're going to carry a present to give to that man. And so among the other things that he says in verse 11, you take down for this man, doesn't know it's his son Joseph, you take him a little honey. Isn't that remarkable? How's that promised land described? As a land that flowed with milk and honey. You never read honey being associated with Egypt. Can you imagine if you're the Pharaoh down there, or if you're the jo Joseph's down there, and, and he's, if his, Jacob assumes he's an Egyptian, and you go into there, and you really want to give him an impression, we brought you something from home. And I find it rather interesting that he mentions that uh, you find the best fruits of the land. There wouldn't be that many if there's a famine. You take the best uh, uh, fruits of the land and you carry some balm, some spices, and some myrrh, and you take some nuts and some almonds. But I want to look, focus in on that little honey because I want you to understand that there's some little honey that you need in your marriage. Little honey, that spice, that, that sweetness that's not found in a lot of marriages. Now if you ask the question, why should I do this? My marriage is in the pits and so much, just, just give, me, give, me, give me some reason on earth. Why I'll not just throw up my hands and quit? Well, I want to tell you one of the reasons is your marriage is from heaven used to be in all ceremonies. It's not in many ceremonies now. But dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the presence of God and in the presence of these witnesses. Why is that? Why is that even in a marriage ceremony? Because those who perform marriage ceremonies and those who wrote the vows in, 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 you know, years and years ago understood What's happening here is not some just social arrangement. Some caveman saw a cave woman and said, you know, let's hang out together. That's not the way it was. You know, it's just, you know, that's not the, that's not the way it goes. God brought Eve 
to Adam. And God ordained marriage. Now, it wasn't just that marriage. I'm telling you, he handpicked Adam's wife. He gives us the freedom to make our own mistakes in whom we marry. But let me tell you, whenever, whenever you say, I do, now, young people, listen to this. When you say, I do, you've done it. You've got one shot at this, you know, unless there's sin or death involved in that, in that relationship. You know why that is? Because when they came to Jesus and said, can I get rid of my wife for every reason? I don't, you know, she burns the biscuits. I don't like her. She too, she's too much like her mother, you know, and all, all those reasons that are given. I found somebody else I'd rather hang out with. You know what Jesus said? What God has joined together by the power invested in me by the state of Florida as a minister of the gospel of Christ, I now pronounce you husband and wife. And then what God has joined together. You know what happened? That marriage, and even in front of a justice of the peace, was registered in heaven. You've got to understand that's how important it is. There are things that are done on this earth that, that, uh, that do not rise to this level at all. But this, this thing rises to this level. And so I ask you tonight to honor the fact that God ordained marriage. And it wouldn't be marriage if there were not God. You take God out of marriage in America and people cannot even define what a marriage is. You need to honor the fact that whenever I said I do and she says I do, that something happened that was till death do us part. And then this statement, what God has joined together, let no mortal put asunder. The translation of that word is man, but it's not, that's not, that's not, uh, uh, we're not talking about gender there. It's the word anthropos. Let no mortal on this earth put asunder that which God has joined together. You hear that? Is it lawful for me to put away my wife for every cause? In the Muslim religion, it's my understanding that you can divorce your wife if you look at her three times and say, you know, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce, and you can stop right before the you, and you've made your point. But if you say it the third time, at least in some Muslim countries, it's over. Oh, no, it's not over. We're no longer in love. Let's just get a divorce. No, you're not divorced. No mortal, no judge, no legislature can put asunder that which God joins together. And don't you ever in counseling get outside the framework of the Bible in counseling somebody in, in, in reference to marriage and say, well, if I were you, I'll tell you, I'd just leave him. You don't have that right. You don't have a right to get outside the framework of the Bible and say to another, you can ignore what God has joined together let no mortal put asunder that which God has joined together. And therefore, it's worth it. Well, now, but Dan, we're having all kinds of problems. That's what this lesson is all about. I want us to look and, and, and recognize a principle that Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, when he says, love your enemies, we talked about this Sunday morning a week ago, that enemy there may be your mate. Bless them that curse you. That may be your mate. That may be the enemy they have. It may be the worst enemy you've got in your life. Pray for them that despitefully use you. How am I supposed to treat him? How am I supposed to, how am I supposed to, uh, you agape them. That's the Greek word. And agape has to do with actions. And this list of things that you've given for us to look at and to share with each other is actions. What little thing can my mate do to show his love for me? What has my mate done in the past that's been so meaningful to me? You know what that is? 
It's action. It's agape love. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 46, if you agape them that agape you, what do ye more than others? Do not even the, the publicans do this? You know what that says? That even those who are unbelievers, as a rule, treat other people nice who are nice to them. If you agape those that, that uh, only those that love you, you're no different from the world. But that does say the world responds in this way. And oftentimes in marriage counseling, this is the very road path that I've gone down to try to help save marriages. And by the help of God, some marriages have been, have been saved by getting that wife who really despises her husband and is ready to give up on him. Or to get that husband who really despises his wife and is ready to give up, to give up on them to say, Tell me two or three things your mate could do. And let him pick one of the three to show you that he loves you. You know why I don't say let him pick all three? Because then you'd be the boss. That's the whole problem is you're already crossways with your mate. She's not going to tell me what to do. He's not going to tell me what to do. Okay, here's, a, here's something we could do. What are three little things? Let him pick one of them. And by that I mean the least painful. So that he can show you that he loves you. How can husbands and wives at Palm Beach Lakes show their love to each other? And you've got the answer, not me. We asked you, you know, two weeks ago, Write down some of the things, maybe it was last Sunday, write down some things that your mate has done. Now, if I were in a marriage counseling situation and we were sitting at the table and I'm on one side and you're on the other, I would say, reach over there and grab your mate's hand. Just hold hands underneath the table. And every time I read one of these things, not these things that are here, but from another list that I've had in the past, every time I read one of these things that you wish your husband would do, because he doesn't understand what you want. My husband doesn't understand me. Here's your opportunity. Every time that I read one of these things you wish that your husband would do, squeeze his hand. And I say to the wife, or, or, or to the husband, every time I read one of these things you wish that your wife would do, squeeze her hand. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Now, if you're sitting next to your husband or next to your wife, you may want to just reach over, and nobody's allowed to peep. Uh, you know, Scott and your kids are not allowed to reach over to see when, you, when your hand's getting squeezed. And don't you be like one young man was in that marriage situation. I had a list of about a hundred things and he had his hands under the table and I was just, I wasn't making any comment. I'm just doing what I'm about to do right here, right now. And when I got to the 100th one, he pulled his hand out and went like that. <laughs> so uh, if, she, if she squeezes your hand right now, I don't know that I would leave any recognition of it. And uh, you may not choose to do this, but I'm telling you, it might help your marriage. This lesson will be on the internet. And if your husband's not here or your wife's not here, or if you're getting involved in marriage counseling and you're trying to help people save their marriage, go to the website and say, here's what those godly folks at Palm Beach Lake said. Here's the question. There are 71 of these. I don't think I'll read all 71 of them. Here's the question. Name one thing, even a small thing, your spouse does or did that really showed his or her love and strengthened your marriage. Are you ready? Taking care of me every time I was in need. 
being there in all ways I needed. He told me he loved me. How long has it been, guys? Studying God's Word together helps keep the Word of God in the house. He does everything with me. Every day He tells me He loves me. He has never left the toilet seat up. <laughs> he grabs and holds my hands when we pray. He always calls when he knows he's going to be late, and I do the same for him. We always say, I love you, many times during the day. We pray together. Does the dishes daily without complaining. He holds my hand when praying. He shows total trust and allows me to be me and doesn't try to change me. He accepts my faults and my strengths. Cooks. Cleans the house. Supports everything I do. Allows me to be my own person. He got baptized. He prays for me and encourages me when I'm not well. Cooks dinner. Trusts me in many ways, especially with money. Laughter and joy. Prayed together morning and evening. She bakes my favorite cake. Always shows respect for me and puts me first. He leaves me notes to find in the morning. When was the last time you gave a card unexpectedly to your wife? Time out. Don't tell Judy. She loves cards. Cards are just paper and ink to me. I mean, they don't, they don't, you, you understand? I don't look at cards like she does. She loves them. I go to Hallmark and I buy 10 cards. I hide them in the house. And Judy, every now and then, unexpectedly gets a card from me. Don't tell your wife that you've got them hidden in the house, but we're not done. I mean, we, were, we don't know sometimes how to do it. And I mean those cards when I give them to Judy, and they mean so much to her. He texts me every day, every weekday morning to encourage me. Here's another one. He puts the toilet seat down most of the time. He makes me laugh. He's never raised his voice to me or lost self-control. Respects me. Sincerely prays me for a thought I express or an action I did or on my appearance. Ignored my stupidity. Let me find it out on my own time, or even just forgot it forever. Supported me, even though it may not be a mutual thought or effort, but was important to me. He always, or well, I say he, this is, the, the gender is not on this, takes my side. You want to stop your in-law problems? then take your, ma your mate's side and stand up to your meddling mama or your meddling daddy. Leave your father and your mother and cleave to your wife. He takes my side, always listens, always patient and kind, 
insisted that I elevate my foot when my ankle was swollen for over three weeks, kissed me, and professed his love for me every morning before departing for work. Listens. When I say I would like to have something, spouse goes out of their way and gets it. Helping and encouraging me continuously. Forgiving me when I make a mistake. Makes sure, gets to work every morning, and sends me love texts. Let's me know he wants to spend time with me and wants me to work less. Tells me to slow down. Always makes sure he kisses me goodnight and tells me he loves me. Tells me often that I'm beautiful, pretty, and very attractive to him. Opens the door for me always. Showing affection, holding hands, kissing, or cheek hugs. Cuts my hair for me. Make sure the house is kept well. We can be silly together. Affection holds my hand during prayer. Spending quality time with me and the efforts to travel with me. Carving a beautiful wood structure that reflect, reflects our relationship. Sends me a loving text out of the blue. Writes encouraging notes and love letters in my lunchbox. Cooks dinner for us. Listens to my concerns and attempts to make things less stressful and worrisome. Encourages. Disposes of large bugs for me. <laughs> You're on your own with spiders. Always willing to serve. Been beside my side throughout all situations, good and bad. Open communication. Respect and love. Makes me coffee and brings it to me. Supports me around the house and backs me up when disciplining the, the children. Thankfulness for when a task is completed. Care and concern for our children. Dresses nice and takes care of herself. How many of those could you not put in your marriage? Little things mean a lot. We've got another list here. One small thing you wish that your mate would do. I'm going to read this list of 34 and then we'll stop. What could my husband, what could my wife do that would make our marriage better? Communicate. Do not focus on things that do not have relevance to our house. And expected or unexpected embrace and a kiss. What can he or she do? Be more romantic. Random flowers, date night, cards, gifts, just because. No holiday, nothing special. Follows my lead, trusts my lead, and pushes my lead. Takes me out to certain places. Continue to show love. Retire. Mop the house. Be patient with me. Close the drawer in the bathroom. Put things back where they belong. Understanding. Massage my feet and my legs when I have unbearable cramps. Always tell me the truth. Positive affirmation, thank you for all that you do. Stands up to their mother when it is about their spouse. 
allow me to take over and be in charge of certain situations, listens and is honest in all areas, keeps God first in our home, handles small issues without making it a bigger issue, watch TV and play games without reprimand, less complaining, speak with respect, exercise more often together, watch a sunset or a sunrise together, not go to bed upset over an issue, less complaining, try to set a more positive tone after a long day, be home before me, don't stop dating me, listen, have and maintain a financial budget and random affections. 106 things. That's agape love. Almost every one of these, if not every one of them, has to do with actions. And your husbands and your wives have indirectly spoken to you through this very pulpit. Your husband or your wife may have put some of these very things down. The other questions about topics that could be discussed and what advice would you give to those who are not yet married? We'll work them into a marriage seminar that we might have here. It's something that we've sort of talked about. Guys, we need feedback from you. These lessons that we're having here in February. We've had seminars before, and the folks that need to come oftentimes do not come. And that's tragic. We bring in speakers, we have marriage seminars, and people don't show up. Treasure and honor your marriage and do everything you possibly can to make it the best it can be. It might be true, you'd have been happier if you'd married somebody else but you didn't. So take yourself where you are and agape, that's actions. These very things we've talked about tonight. Agape your mate, that's actions. And see if, not, if they will not do what even pagans often do and that is they, in turn, begin to agape you. I thank God that when God drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden into a world where there was going to be murder and vice and, and all that is evil and vile, even down to weeds that, are in, that infest the earth, that when they left the paradise of God, the Garden of Eden, they were able to bring one part of that paradise out of the garden. And that's marriage. I beg of you, invest whatever energy it takes in your marriage to make it the best marriage that the two of you could ever, ha could ever have and perhaps far beyond what, either, what the two of you could have ever dreamed that it would be. God help us. There is a relationship that we have with Christ, and that is that relationship when we become his child. You know, we said in that invitation two weeks ago, what about you to be married to Jesus? The very form of marriage 
is you that is that we understand is what the Lord uses to talk about our relationship to Jesus. You're not a Christian. I love the way David extended the invitation this morning. You're not a faithful Christian. Your marriage is not going to be any good. You could become a Christian tonight if you'll believe in Him. If you will repent of your sins, how difficult is it to believe in Jesus? That's a little thing. And when we understand the consequences of sin and all the adversity and trouble that it brings in our life, we can turn away from it. It's not worth dealing with all of the mess that sin brings into your life. That's a little thing. And when you confess that you believe in Jesus, then you can be baptized and he'll wash away your sins. And you will become, when you do these things, he adds you to his family, to the church, to his bride. You're married to Jesus. And then he says, you be faithful like he encourages us to be faithful to our mates, so he says to us, the bride of Jesus, you be faithful to me, and I'll give you the crown of life. If you need to respond to this invitation, if you're not a faithful Christian, and there's something that you need to do in order that you might be one, won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now, as together we stand and sing. Will you come?